Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. This is our final Wednesday night growth community of the century. So, just kidding. We'll be back in the fall, I think. I don't know. Um, I've enjoyed. Uh, I've enjoyed this year. We across the board. It was kind of neat here. Typically, numbers about Marchish. As soon as it starts to get nice, maybe the time change. So maybe early April, everything tanks, and it's like me and Jen, and a couple other real Christians that stay. You know, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's it's really it gets sparse really quickly because spring is here, and so much starts to happen. It's sports and trips and uh, all kinds of different things happen. So just schedules get in the way. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, so this year across the board, it was really neat. I was talking to. Uh, our grow pastor, Roy, who was here Sunday. And uh, he said numbers across the board have really held strong uh, throughout the spring, which has been really great for growth community. So excited about that. Uh, but yeah, tonight will be our, our last one uh, for the summer. So we'll get some info to you about the fall. A couple things to let you know about this Sunday. Uh, is our men's event. So guys, make sure that you're marking your calendar to be there uh, this Sunday night at our uh, Holly location. Uh, super excited. Uh, there's a guy that does a, a podcast that I listen to every week that I just reached out to him to see if he would come and speak. So he's driving up. He's coming up from Virginia uh, to speak. And uh, so excited about him. Just an awesome dude, awesome pastor. And so he's coming on Sunday night to speak. Uh, we got uh, food trucks, and we have axe throwing, and we have a golf simulator. We got a rock wall that I'm not going near, um, but a whole bunch of fun stuff. So guys, you come out, bring a friend, uh, bring your sons, uh, bring your dad, whatever it might be, but just an awesome night uh, to be here. If you got students, uh, Keaton will be bringing uh, all of the guys, so the 6th through 12th grade boys, uh, the young men will be coming down. Uh, to Holly. So just some cool stuff um, uh, on Sunday night. So mark your calendars. Do not miss that. I, I want to strongly, strongly encourage you. Uh, obviously, it's Sunday evening. Maybe you want to just check out and get ready for the, the week or whatever it might be. Don't do that. Make sure you're there on Sunday night and um, it will be awesome. So it starts, dinner will start. The food trucks and all that stuff will open up about five o'clock. So you can come and hang out and uh, playing cornhole or whatever it might be, get to know some guys, and then about 7 o'clock uh, we'll do some music. We're doing a game with the location pastors, which is a bit of a surprise, but I'll clue you in on it. So our youth pastors, our youth student guys, every summer do something called Wheel Unfortunate, and it is where there are, again, I've never, or I take it back, I did see it one time, so I'll try to explain it the best that I can. It's a wheel... Basically, it all funnels down to one guy's name gets picked, and he has to spin the wheel for something very unfortunate. Um, and so for us on Sunday night, uh, there are several things um, that are on the wheel unfortunate. So I have a one in six chance of being the lucky pastor uh, that gets to choose, that gets to spin the wheel. There are several things. One is a paintball firing squad. Uh, one is you have to cannonball into the baptismal. Um, one is you have to get a full back henna tattoo of reach, gather, grow. Um, so there's just some completely ridiculous things that I'm really crossing my fingers do not happen to me. So one is you have to get your ear pierced live there. So there is that. There, there is that. So, um, yeah, so there, there's several things that are just terrible. So I'm like, I'm regretting giving them permission to do that. Like, that's great. Yeah, go ahead and do that. So uh, anyway, so that will be fun, but it's going to be an awesome night. So I reached out to my friend Brian and asked him uh, to come and to just kind of challenge our guys. And uh, so excited about it. So make sure you're there on Sunday night. Make sure you're encouraging guys in your circle of influence and friends to be there. And again, you can come out, bring, bring a couple bucks. You can go to the food trucks and enjoy some barbecue and 
uh, just hang out for a little bit, and then it'll be uh, it will be a great night. So really excited uh, about that. Okay, um, let me make sure I'm telling you everything I'm supposed to because it is the last Wednesday. I want to check that box. So uh, yeah, that's it. So Sunday night uh, the uh, event there, and uh, will just be awesome. We had some great things coming up uh, in the summer. So, um, we get some great things coming up in the summer camps and uh, VBS at all of our locations and uh, some different things. But uh, one of the things I did want to share with you is we have a church uh, in Lake Orion that uh, our location pastor, uh, Pat, uh, our locations, operations and locations pastor, uh, presented to on Sunday. Uh, and they'll be voting. Um, in June, so June the 13th, I believe it is, uh, to be uh, part of us. I think you guys know the church, actually, uh, somewhat familiar. So anyways, so um, yeah, when you guys told me you were from Gingerville, uh, it was like, I already knew about it way back then. So we were in different conversations with Josh Yates and everything. Yeah, yeah. So there's a church uh, over in Lake Orion, and so we're excited about that uh, possibility. So uh, kind of a Kind of a neat thing. So be in prayer for that. Be in prayer for their pastor. His name is Josh. We're going to make him change his name because we already have too many Joshes on our staff. We're looking at another kids guy for one of our other locations. And I'm like, what's his name? Josh? Nope. Can't hire him. I don't, I don't care if he's God's guy or not. We got to stop hiring people with the name Josh. But uh, whatever. So uh, anyway, so some good stuff. So let's pray together and uh, we'll get started Tonight, Lord, thank you so much uh, for your love for us. Thank you for your grace, Lord, and your patience with us. And I just pray, God, that you would bless tonight. I pray that you would uh, teach us some things tonight. Pray, God, uh, for just a, a sweet uh, evening together, a uh, good kind of ending to a great uh, season in our Wednesday nights together in growth communities and I pray for the men's night on Sunday. I pray, God, that you do a mighty work uh, in my life. I pray you do a mighty work in the life of each man in our church. Just do something incredible, Lord. Uh, pray for um, a church there in Lake Orion, God. You just encourage them. I pray, God, you would um, just continue to move and encourage Josh Yates. And uh, so thankful, God, for so many awesome things that are happening. So please bless tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, if you have any questions, I need that. I always ask you to use this, not because this helps anybody in here hear you any better, but uh, for the folks online to hear maybe the question. Uh, I'm terrible at repeating questions. Doesn't matter how many times someone tells me, hey, repeat the question. I never do. Uh, for some reason, I have a brain block about repeating questions. But uh, anyways, but if you have any questions, maybe a church question, maybe a Bible question, maybe a personal question, uh, you can ask any question you want. If you're watching online, you have questions already. I'm getting those texted in. So my wife is home tonight. Uh, our youngest daughter uh, cut her toe all right, poor Mavis, I don't even understand, cut her toe running up the back brick steps. Uh, so barefoot, sliced her toe pretty good. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth and uh, much blood, and it was uh, not good. So she's okay now, but she's at home. The problem is tonight is the Iwana store. And so I said to her, you, you can shop through FaceTime tonight. So I said, how about you do the Iwana store online? And... Uh, I'm like, you can do that right from the comfort of your couch. So she, she was pumped about that. So a bit of a diva, I'm not going to lie. Um, so, so we'll do that for her afterwards. But anyways, anybody have any questions in here? I want to give you a, a shot uh, at asking anything you want about anything. And you won't get to ask another question until September. So well, I'm sure you can ask it another time. But maybe you have something uh, on your mind. What's that? Where's Jack? Jack always gets you guys going with questions. Well, I have a question online, but I'm going to give you guys first shot, okay? Yeah. 
You do. All right, here, take this. I know how much you love this. Jay, catch it. Okay, so I don't have the actual reference for this. You'll probably know it. Oh, gosh, that um, is a... And I, I tried searching it. I still didn't find it. You can't Google it. No, I can't. Okay. No, well, I don't have Google. Okay, so. I'll text Jen and have her Google it for me. Okay. And then she can text it to me. There's a verse... This is, this is a good way to start this. There is a verse. And the gist of it is that um, there must be bad doctrine or, or false teachers out there so that the truth can be known. Yeah. So that true ones can show um, what the truth is. I just totally botched that. No, you didn't botch it. And it, the problem is I don't know where it's at. I forget. Okay. To be really honest with you. I, I thought it was in First Corinthians because I've been reading. Yeah, that, it may but. be. Uh, by um, the way, I don't know if you noticed my, my unicorn stickers. First Corinthians eleven nineteen. Yeah. Okay. So there are factions, is what it is. There are right. factions among. I think it's. I don't know how the ESV words it. King James uses the word factions, and I I believe that because there must be factions. So right. First Corinthians eleven, what exactly? So the my question is, you know, the church gets sidetracked so often, uh, worrying about what everyone else is doing, and. Uh, the false doctrines and the false teachings that are out there, and um, maybe we should look more closely at, at this topic and worry more about what we're sure. doing. Sure. So tell me the reference again. Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. Okay. Yeah, so the Lord's Supper. So there in verse 19, for there must be factions among you. So verse 18, for in the first place when you come together as a church... I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you must be recognized. Okay, So there, there are factions. So let's hold our spot there and rewind to the beginning of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians uh, chapter number one. So there in verse number 14. So if you remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at the founding of the church at Corinth and how Paul did that. Paul preached and people got saved and it was a, uh, just a neat work of the Lord. Verse 14, Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius so that none or no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. So Paul's saying, I baptized these people. The problem is there's a division, verse 12. Like there's a division, a quarreling among you. And what I mean is each one of you says, I follow Paul. So there would have been obviously some, some fierce loyalty to Paul because he was the apostle that God used to give birth to the church. So they, they would have been thankful for Paul. The problem was, is someone was being lost in the mix. So some were saying, I follow Paul. Others, others were saying they follow Apollos. Others follow Cephas. Oh, and I follow Christ. So verse 13, is Christ divided? So if you jump over to chapter number 3, in verse number 5, Paul has to deal with this throughout this letter, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. So Apollos was a great preacher, a great orator. He would have fit very much in the Greco-Roman culture. His name really suggests that. It's a very strong name. But he also was great at speaking, which was highly valued to the Greeks. So remember that. So Paul says, what is Apollos and, and what am I? What's Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And so he talks about he who plants, he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So a little bit of a transition 
in metaphor there. But what is Paul saying? He's saying people come along and they plant the seed. People come along and they water the seed, but it's God who does the miracle of bringing new life, of bringing spiritual birth. So there were those factions uh, in the church at Corinth, and uh, Paul is going to deal with those here in uh, the letter to the First Corinthians. The faction would actually get worse in, uh, by time Paul writes 2 Corinthians. So if you want to jump over to 2 Corinthians, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse number 4. We'll look, about, look at this a little bit, uh, God willing, this weekend. So Paul says there, um, For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and many uh, tears. So Paul is going to reference here and some other places in this letter something he calls the severe letter. So we have, I'm just going to give you this. So there's Paul's first letter to Corinth. And then there is what we know as 1 Corinthians. And then there is the severe letter, which we don't have but seem to be a bombshell. And then there was 2 Corinthians. By time Paul writes 2 Corinthians, so there's a major theme here. If you remember chapter, chapter 6, excuse me, it's chapter 5. Chapter 5. Paul has to deal with a guy who is having an uh, inappropriate sexual relationship with his stepmother. And so Paul has to deal with that here. They didn't repent, and so Paul sends them a severe letter. Some repented. By the time he writes 2 Corinthians, Paul, it's, it's his most. As I've been studying, I studied some this morning, and as I've been studying over the last couple of weeks, it is his most emotional and I don't want to, this is not a criticism of the word of God, but it is his most poorly written letter because it is just him bearing his soul because he knows that two things are going to happen. He is going to comfort those who are faithful and he is coming to confront those who have abandoned the faith. And the way that they had abandoned the faith, a couple different ways, uh, one of them was that they had begun to disparage Paul. That's what's happening. I, don't, I haven't listened to Roy's sermon from this past Sunday yet, but um, that's what's happening in that portion there when they began to criticize him. Well, you said you were going to come and you didn't make it. Is that because you're weak? Is that because you're suffering? Is that because Christ isn't really in you and you're not really dedicated to this? And so all these different rumors and criticisms had happened. And so after this severe letter, now Paul has to come to him and be like, no, the reason I didn't come God didn't open this door, he moved this, changed this, all these different things, but I am coming. And the reason I didn't come at this one time, this Second Corinthians 1, is I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. And so what we're seeing is I think the timeline is Second, First Corinthians and Second Corinthians is about a year apart. I think, I think it's ballpark what it is. So, so Paul is laying down the law, like I'm coming to confront and once and for all deal with the fact that I am an apostle and if you ignore my apostleship, you're actually ignoring Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So I'm in this spot. I am who I am because of Christ Jesus. If you ignore me, you are ignoring Christ Jesus. So, but at the same time, there's a confrontation, but there's also comfort in the fact that, hey, if you are following what Paul is teaching, you're following Jesus. You're following what the Lord has laid down through the apostles. So to, uh, to John's point, there were factions, there were divisions. And so we, we actually were having a conversation prior to this that, I don't know how to even draw this. So let's try to... There is scripture... And we know that the Word of God is the final authority, meaning what the Scripture says, when we say inerrant, we mean that it means that what the Bible says is true is always true. So 
It's never going to change that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. That's, that truth is never going to change over time. That's, that's inerrant truth. So the Word of God, Scripture, is inerrant. It's authoritative. It's inspired by, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote the Word of God. And there is a... I don't know how I want to say this. I'm just going to work on this through. There is an acceptable range... It's kind of what I'm drawing there. An acceptable range of interpretation of things. There's, a, there's an acceptable range of, this is what I believe the Bible is saying. But then, as we've talked about before, there are immovables. Like there are immovable truths of the Word of God. Go forward into 2 Corinthians and go to 2 Corinthians 11, and you'll essentially find Paul laying down in verse number 4. He's going to confront what he calls the super apostles, these guys. He's like, I'm coming for you. I love it. It's a bit intense. It's kind of fantastic. It kind of has a Western vibe to it. Okay, So I've been watching a lot of Western movies lately. I got War Wagon the other day. It was so great. What else did I buy? Oh, I bought the original Magnificent Seven. It was so wonderful. It was so good. Yule Brenner, fantastic. Okay, so there in verse 4, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you received, or if you receive or accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. So they come and they give another Jesus. And they come and they talk about another spirit, and they come and they preach another gospel. These are immovables. These are, these are to die for. And the problem is, and I, what John is saying, there are factions within the church of God that are in the acceptable range. Different interpretations of things. And so I was actually joking with some people the other day. When I, when I preach to our church and I look around the auditorium, I, there are sections of people that clump up together. Okay? I know that our really excited Pentecostal people are right to my front left. I know that the free Methodists sit in the back two rows of this section and then the first row of the next section. I know the Reformed people sit in the far left-hand side of the back section, and I know the Baptists, no joke, are all the way in the back. Okay? It's just the way it is. And they always sit in the same dang seats. It's just, it's just funny to think about. So I just think about that, right? They all don't agree on lots of stuff. It's okay. But there's an acceptable range of interpretation of Scripture. What Paul is dealing with here is that he's saying there's factions in the church that are there, but I think he's also saying there are factions in the church that need to be confronted because they've started to compromise the truth of who Jesus is and the truth of what Jesus did, this is actually happening massively right now. One of the things that is being attacked is this word atonement. What did Jesus accomplish on the cross? That's actually being undermined really subtly in, in um, a massive way. Uh, it is, it's really sourced to a church out in California called Bethel, a guy named Bill Johnson. He's a heretic. He's a liar. He's deceptive. And people think, well, he's using all the same lingo. This is actually being undermined, what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Not to mention the Holy Spirit, not to mention the gospel, but that's actually being attacked. The Holy Spirit. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? What did the Holy Spirit do? And that is, you have to try the spirits. First John, I think it's First John 4. Try the spirits, discern. Not every spirit is from God. The gospel, what is the gospel? What is the good news of Jesus? These are the immovables. And, and so there might be someone that disagrees about eschatology, there might even be someone who disagrees 
uh, uh, you know, like end time stuff is what I'm talking about. I say eschatology, like someone who is pre pre trib and mid trib and post trib and I'm millennialist and all these different things, right? Like we have to know that. Now I'm going to say this about scripture. Scripture must govern these. So John and I were having a bit of a rant prior to the gathering, or prior to tonight. tonight. These often govern that. We all have these. We all have our preferences. And one of the things that I'm realizing about my, at my age now is if I let this determine how the church goes, we will lose the next generation. We'll lose them. They'll be gone. And people think that means, well, you got to have this production element. You got to, no, 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 no. No, we are having, it's incredible. The staff and I were talking about it yesterday. We are having a flood of 18 to 22 year olds in our church right now, here in Goodrich. Like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Well, I'm not cool, Right? I'm not going to... Stop shaking your head, Todd. <laughs> right. No, I'm not a cool guy. I don't care, right? I'm an overweight father of five. I'm 40 years old. I don't care about being cool anymore. That, 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 that's, that is long gone in my life. And here's what I realized. Like, that is not what the next generation is looking for. The next generation is looking for authenticity, for something that is real, because they have lived in very much a fake phony world. And so we provide that authenticity and we want to preach the word of God. The problem is if we as old people start letting that dictate the day, it's game over. It's game over. We start saying, well, the music's too loud. Music's too soft. Music's too fast. Music's too new. Can we do old songs? Can we do new songs? I hate that song. Can we do the other song again? I don't like the preaching. I don't like that he stands behind a podium. Can he get a pulpit? Because that's sacred. That's in the Bible somehow. And th I'm serious. Th but people use whacked out, twisted scripture because they're trying to shoehorn the scripture into their preferences. And if we do that, it's, it's lights out. And so what do we got to do? We got to recognize we all have our preferences. Every single one of us do. Like I was at, I preached uh, at The Rock on Sunday. So for my friend Wes, I was out in Fenton preaching and um, I was telling these guys just before, I'm a terrible guest speaker uh, because I don't know what it's like to like talk to people for the first time. Like if you come to our church, I pretty much yell at you for an hour every single week and then tell you I love you and then then you come back. And I'm like, I don't know why. But like, so going to guest speak, it's like you're with other people and you're like, oh gosh, I, I can't, I, I have to be nice. Uh, it's, so it's different. So I'm just, that's why I feel like a bad guest speaker, right? Um, the girl gets up there to sing. Super fantastic singer. Like her heart for the Lord, what they're singing was awesome. But she came on stage barefoot. What's my preference? Put some shoes on. How hard is that? You brought some to the building. I, 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 I actually saw them on you earlier, right? My preference is put some dang shoes on. Now let's ask, let, um, let's be serious. Does it matter? No, no, it doesn't matter. It does not matter whether she's wearing shoes or not. God is not like, oh, I was going to accept that worship. I can't put some shoes on. Probably the opposite is true, right? Take your sandals off. You're on holy ground, right? God said to Moses, right? I'm not making a point that we have to all be barefoot on Sunday. But I, I, I realized in that moment, I had a preference. I had a preference, but what did I not have? I have a single scripture to walk up to her and say, <clears throat> the Lord says you should wear shoes. I didn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or Hezekiah, right? So what happens though, is we walk into places and someone does something that we don't like. And we stop serving and we stop giving 
and we start talking about it and we start rallying other people to our position. I was warning the staff about it yesterday in a long talk about Psalm 1. We put ourselves in the seat of the scoffer and then what starts to happen? We start to find people that have the same preferences as us and we create our holy huddles and this stops mattering as supreme. It happens to every generation. It does. It happens, at every church. It happens at every church. And so we have to fight it. And that's why, so for our, our folks that are 60, 70, sitting in here, watching online or here on Sunday, we have to, you, you're going to have to suck up some things you don't like. And that's not because you don't matter. That's because we realize there are other people who matter more than us. So I've told people this hundreds of times. No one believes me. My preference is that we have an organ as a permanent fixture on the right side of the stage and a grand piano on the left side of the stage and we have a pulpit in the middle and someone gets up there and says, open your hymnals. I would be in heaven. Now, some of you are like, you're a liar and you're not telling the truth, but that's the fact. You know why? Because I have a sweet affection for that in my life. I do. I have a, I have a sweetness where I was like, man, I love opening that soul-stirring hymn book that frankly has some garbage doctrinal hymns in it, right? But I love it. Let's sing, let's sing page 181, which is Love Lifted Me, and let's sing it every Sunday, and let's end the gathering with I Surrender All or All to Jesus or Just As I Am, every single week. That's my preference. So if I decide well, that's what we're going to do, you're going to be like, well, what about my preference? Well, what about my preference? And a lot of times, to John's point, factions are built around this. They're built around this. Rather than having a healthy conversation about an acceptable range of Bible interpretation. Well, this is what I think the scripture's saying. You do? Well, this is what I think it says. Why do you think it says that? Not debates, not Bible college stupid ego debates, but hey, what do you think? You think that's really interesting. How did you come to that conclusion? What, how did you get to that opinion? And it's all based on the foundation of the immovables. And the problem is in so many churches, these are not preached on. They're believed. In a lot of evangelical churches, these are believed. But those have been eclipsed by these, and that's why we are an ineffective church. That's why the church in America is ineffective, because preferences rule the day. We all have them. Please hear me. It's okay to have your preferences. I have mine. You have yours. There's nothing wrong with that. I had to go, that girl's not wearing shoes. I don't like that. I, I, she should put on shoes. But what's it matter? This is a 20-something-year-old young lady who is worshiping Jesus. And then I'm going to be the jerk face that goes, hey, great job. <clears throat> Next time you get up there, wear shoes. Right? Really? R really? Like, that's the, I have no Bible for that whatsoever. That's just a preference. And then the problem is we let our preferences rule us and then we try to go find churches and people that have the same preferences as us and then it's just holy huddles that do nothing for the cause of the gospel. You wait for the mic? You got to wait for the mic. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it, Scott. All I was going to say is, as a pastor, it's just because you're worried about her soul. Souls. Oh, gosh. <laughs> John, can you take the mic from him? Like it's you're really you're gonna end the year with that one, Scott. Wow. All right. Anyway, and here's again, John and I had a conversation about this before. We are not immune to this. And we have to be maturing in our walk with the Lord so we know that. We do. We have to be 
we have to see that. We all have our preferences. We all have things that we like. We all have things the way we want them to be. But if Scripture is the final authority, if these things are immovable, or if these are being proclaimed faithfully, I'm going to tell you this. this maybe I'm just a little annoyed with it tonight. If these are being faithfully preached, don't waste your time going to find another church. Just get busy serving where you are. <laughs> That's just as simple as it could be. Like, people have come from all different churches. Some of you come from different churches, different circumstances, fine. You're here. These are being preached faithfully. Lock in, get to work. Let's go. Don't waste your life church hopping. Don't waste your life church shopping. Don't do it. Now, if those... Those are compromised. Run away. Run away. Like, run away as quickly as you can. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you like the pastor. Doesn't matter if you think he's a good person or you think I'm a good... If I go off the rails, run away. Run away. Take your kids and your family and everybody you can with you. Okay? All right. Souls. All right, so question online. This one's going to be an interesting one. Wondering your thoughts on a church hosting Christian concerts on site and selling alcoholic beverages. Pass. Okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's an interesting question. So you're getting into, oh gosh, you're getting into an issue of alcohol. So... Since we're in 1 Corinthians, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. So, a little personal background. I do not drink. I never have. I have never touched an, a drop of alcohol. Uh, it was always scary to me. My grandfather, before he got born again, was an alcoholic. And uh, so it was always um, warned against, probably overly so. Um, but I, I never had any interest in it. Uh, personally, being drunk was never a sin that was appealing to me. So I have control issues, so I like being in control. So that never appealed to me in the slightest bit, okay? Um, but it's one of the subjects in the Bible. Man, it's funny how the Lord leads stuff. It's just, I'm so thankful. It's a preference thing, okay? So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Paul's illustration here is about meat meat offered to idols. That was a particularly sensitive subject. Can you eat a sacrifice that was sacrificed to demons? And so Paul has to go through these different things. And so verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone and everything I do, I do not seek my own advantage but that of many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So Paul says, this is the issue. The issue is meat. He says, I am going to eat meat on occasion. And then there will be other occasions where I will not eat meat because it will offend the conscience of the person that I'm with because they came out of maybe paganism. They came out of a, an idol-worshiping cult. And so it really it messes with their brain to see me doing that. Um, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, the, the other thing is, Paul says, I do not want to do anything that will uh, uh, hurt or derail the gospel effort. That's the end of verse, that's the end of verse 33. But that many... Uh, that of many, that they may be saved. So I don't want to do anything that's going to detract or, or derail the conversation into, well, you know, I'm eating this meat. It's okay. Jesus doesn't mind. I know it offends you, but don't worry about it. 
now the conversations become about meat rather than the gospel. And so it's, it's, it's making sure that Paul doesn't, uh, that he keeps the priority, the priority. And that was there. Now, when it comes to alcohol, Jesus went to a wedding and he turned water into wine. He did not turn water into grape juice. Jesus turned water into fermented wine. You say, how do you know it was fermented? There was no refrigeration. It was going to ferment. So alcohol intrinsically is not sinful. You look at Ecclesiastes, it's actually a gift from God. So there's nothing wrong. So that's what you see there in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You can eat to the glory of God. You can drink to the glory of God. You can work to the glory of God. All those different things. Now, a couple caveats. Ephesians, I'll just read it to you real quick. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Do not, verse, or excuse me, 5. Ephesians five eighteen. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. So drunkenness is sin. No question. Drunkenness is sin. To drink is not sin. It's not. And uh, man, the church has guilted people into all kinds of different things. It's not sin. Jesus drank wine. John uh, the Baptist did not. Jesus points it out. He goes, he came and he didn't eat and drink and you ignored him and the son of man comes and he eats and drinks and you call him a, a drunkard and a glutton right? There's no winning with you guys is basically what Jesus is saying. Like it's, you're just insulting everybody. So Jesus drank alcohol. Jesus did not get drunk. Jesus blessed the wedding with wine. Uh, it was fermented. Anybody that tells you it's not, it's a bit silly. Um, it's a kind of just a denial of culture and a real understanding of wine in the first place. Now, I don't drink. Matter of fact, if I'm super transparent, transparent with you, we actually had a conversation with our elders several months ago uh, about um, taking alcohol. We have an alcohol policy in our handbook. So in our staff handbook, there's an alcohol policy where staff is not allowed to drink. So we had a conversation about whether to have it in there or whether not to have it in there. For me, if there's a policy or if there's not a policy, I'm not going to drink. Because I don't care to. I have zero interest in it. It just, it's never, it, when I say it's never appealed to me, it has never appealed to me. I'd rather go to Dairy Queen uh, every day of the week, right? I just, and Dairy Queen's got its own sinful issues, right? <laughs> She's a bad woman. Uh, so, right, I have my own, I have my own things that I got to work on. Going and getting drunk or going and, and drinking has never been something that has appealed to me. So we, we had a conversation about it. What I do know is that for some of you in here, if I came over your house and you offered me a beer and I drank a beer at your house, you wouldn't think twice. You'd be like, okay, whatever. Not, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't affect the gospel with you. It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, uh, cause any uh, stumbling. You wouldn't think less of me as a pastor, or as a Christian or anything. Some of you, if you saw me with a beer in my hand, you'd be horrified. It would really offend you. It would really hurt you. So what do I choose to do? I choose to abstain. That's a liberty that I laid down because I think it's, at least for me, it's more beneficial to lay that liberty down than to try to convince people that truly it is a liberty. So for me, I just go, yeah, I'm out. I don't care. It's, it's not something I, I care to do. It's an easy one for me. Um, so having a concert at a church and selling alcoholic beverages just seems confusing. It's a liberty. It's not sin. It really is not. Again, Jesus went to a wedding. They ran out of wine and Jesus solved the problem by giving them even better wine. The, the, what the host says is, uh, we're supposed to have the bad wine at the end because most people are going to be a little tipsy by then and they won't care. And you save the good wine for the end. Why did we do this? So Jesus created fantastic wine. Um, and that's what he did. So it is not sin. If you went to a concert and there was alcohol served there, that's not intrinsically a sin. 
I don't know why someone would do that. I, I don't know why. And I would go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and say the point of everything we do is, is that people would see Christ in us and that they would be saved. That's the whole point. So you got people that are rolling in there that are like, maybe trying to get clean, trying to get sober, trying to stay sober, whatever it might be. I don't want to derail that. I don't want to derail that at all. And um, and so, again, it's, it's like when you know a someone's story, you're going to be sensitive about certain things. You're, you're going to avoid certain things because you're not going to want to hurt them or bring up certain subjects or, or you're, you're going to be careful about certain things because you love people. But other people, for, for other folks, you're sitting in here, you're watching online, you have a drink, that's okay. You can drink to the glory of God. That's what the Bible is saying. Whether you eat or drink, work, play, vacation, sleep, meals, hobbies, whatever it is, do all to the glory of God. And uh, that's important. But for me, uh, again, someone asked the question, what do I think about that? I, I guess if I'm going to be completely blunt, I think that is foolish. I, I think that is, that is foolish, and we still live in a world where, um, you know, we in America are very much impacted by the religious founders of our nation to think that they didn't drink is preposterous. But we, just a hundred years ago, uh, it was illegal, right? And you had um, prohibition. I mean, that was a real part of our country. And, and that was a, a big, that was a real uh, stage in, in our country's history promoted by religion. Uh, by religious leaders as beneficial to the nation. Um, and uh, so I think we have to recognize that there's still, for us as a culture, a stigma uh, with that. And uh, it leads to more questions that I really want to take the time to answer. So it's like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm out. I don't need to do it. But if you drink in front of me, I don't care. I'm not offended by it at all. Not even in the slightest bit. Would, wouldn't bother me. Um, wouldn't shock me. I wouldn't think less of you. Not, not in the slightest bit. Now you get drunk, we got a problem. Right? That's a problem. That's a sin. Can't do it. And um, so then people are like, well, when do you know someone's drunk? Um, when do you know you lusted? Right? It's not like we can go to the doctor and he takes a test and be like, oh, you lusted. I, I checked your, your blood pressure and <laughs> your blood cell count or whatever. You're like, what? Like, you it's it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter between you and the Lord. And um, so, let me follow up on that besides Scott. I don't want any puns anymore, so. You know, it does not. So it's First Timothy. Uh, there are, First Timothy is the qualifications of a pastor. First Timothy 3. Yeah, it literally says not a drunkard. So there's not a prohibition for pastors not to drink. That's not in the Bible. But it does say pastors should not be drunkards. So going back to preferences. Can you wait on the mic? Oh, no, you don't want to wait. <laughs> so getting drunk on wine. If you can wait on that, that would be good. So going back to preferences, yep. getting drunk on wine, bad. Whiskey and beer, though, we're not sure of yet. Yeah, preferences, <laughs> right, yeah. Right. That's, a, that's the point, right? Scripture. What Scripture say? Ecclesiastes talks about work your job, love your wife, enjoy your wine. This is, Solomon says, there's nothing better in life than this. That's Scripture. You might have a preference, I don't want to drink. Okay? The issue is, funny, John, you and I had a pre-session on all of these different things. The, the issue is when we demand that other people live up to our preferences or for our conscience. That's wrong. So, for example, there were years ago that I had an ACDC song on my phone. I still have uh, Back in Black on there. It's my wife's ringtone. And uh, so, so 
right? I have, I have that song on my phone, but there was a song on there that I listened to and I go, I can't listen. That's a bad song. That does something wrong to my conscience. It just, it just does. So I deleted the song. You might have the song on your phone and it may not do anything to you. I don't care. That's between you and the Lord. But that was, a, that was something that was, was poking at my conscience, right? The Holy Spirit was saying, hey, this is, this is stirring something. Like, I'm like, okay, Lord. Yeah, I'm out. I'm out on this one. And so I think for us, we have to not force our preferences on people. You don't want to drink? Don't drink. There's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, we have some folks that have different preferences or different things that they believe the Bible's saying that falls within the acceptable range. Great. It's great. But it's, it's when we start pounding people over the head, forcing people to follow our particular preferences, that's ridiculous. And so for me, like I would look at the, you know, you're having a concert and you're selling alcoholic beverages. It's not sin. Can you do it to the glory of God? Sure. Is that a weird, confusing message? I just think about the practical nature of that. You got volunteers that are carting people in the lobby of your church. Like, I, I just want to avoid that. That just seems weird. Again, is it sin? No. Is it wrong? Can it be done to the glory of God? Yes. Can you worship Jesus by drinking a beer? Yes. You can do all that. It's like, do I want our volunteers at guest services to be carding? Can I, can I see a card before I say it? Like, nope, nope, no. Nope. I just, I don't want to do it. That just seems, that seems like a waste of effort, to be really frank with you, okay? So um, that's what I would say about that. So I sounded like, uh, gosh, I sound like Forrest Gump there. That's what I got to say about that. That's all I got to say about that. Okay, uh, which is a bad movie. Don't watch that movie. I didn't throw that one away. Uh, anyways, I shouldn't quote that. <laughs> All right. Can you please give me your thoughts on capital punishment? Capital punishment. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So let's go to Genesis. So we'll go right after the flood. So... Let's see. Yeah, Genesis 9, okay? So a couple scriptures that we can look at. Um, and I'll just draw it quickly on the board. So you've seen this a million times, but I'll give it to you again. So you got the four lanes of authority. You got family. And you got church. And you have work. And you have the government. I'm going to tell you, I'm so thankful for air conditioning, by the way, in this building. Oh, so wonderful. Thank you, John. So, um, so this is post-flood uh, Mo, uh, Moses. Moses is not coming off the ark. Noah is coming off the ark. So Noah is coming off the ark. And there in uh, verse number uh, 5, so things are changing a little bit here. God reestablishes there in verse 1, the command, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So that was his command to Adam and Eve. Then he introduces here uh, the predator and prey system. So prior to this, animals did not eat other animals and people did not eat animals. So the predator prey system, any fear of a... People always think about the dinosaurs and different stuff. Prior to the flood, dinosaurs didn't eat meat. So a Tyrannosaurus rex, it might step on you, but it's not going to eat you. So, so that kind of have this here, uh, a warning about eating flesh with its blood, so on and so forth. But verse 5, And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. So he's saying, uh, the lion that you hung out with on the ark, he now will want to eat you. So just, just be aware. So from his fellow man, here. I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So here it is, right here in Genesis 9, and then also in Romans 13. You don't have to turn there, 
but I'll just read one short passage there. Romans chapter 13 uh, says this in uh, verse number four, for he, speaking of government, for he's God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. So God establishes government and he gives us Romans 13 and Genesis 9 as a warning against murder particularly. So that's the verse there, 9, 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. So the warning is on murder. So one of the sacred responsibilities of government is, well, there's two. Core purposes are justice and righteousness. So all my friends that are in government, this is what I tell them. God puts you in that spot to promote justice and to promote righteousness. How do you know what righteousness is? You know it from the word of God. How do you know what justice is? You know it from God because he appointed you. So you don't get to make up what justice is and you don't get to make up what the standard of righteousness is. So part of justice, bearing the sword, we see that in Romans 13, is capital punishment. It's not to be viewed uh, necessarily as a deterrent. People have made that argument over the years. We shouldn't, uh, capital punishment is not a deterrent, so it's impractical, we shouldn't do it. That was never the point. The point was when someone murders someone, um, their life is to be taken, their life is forfeited. And so the government has a responsibility before God to execute that person. Um, throughout the centuries, we've overused it. There's no question about it. If we rewind the clock, we have a dark history with execution. Uh, it's sad. Um, in the scripture, when you were dealing with a capital crime, something that was going to lead to capital punishment, it was never circumstantial evidence. It was two or three witnesses. So the biblical burden of proof is always two or three witnesses. So the scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Um, not circumstantial evidence, not questionable things. There were two people, two or three people, saw it, witnessed it. That, and that is what it is. So it's a, it's a high bar to execute someone. It's not flippant. Um, and, and so you see that in the Old Testament. There were, again, if you go through Leviticus and Exodus, particularly Exodus, you'll see there were certain crimes that were punishable by death. Uh, accidental death was not one of them. You know, your, your cow killed somebody. You're, you're responsible for a certain extent, but it's, you're not being executed because of that. Or maybe you knew that your cow had killed someone before and you didn't do anything about it. Well, now your life is forfeit because you didn't do anything about your, your cow going over and killing somebody. Now, you, now, you're, now justice is for you to die because you didn't care enough to deal with it. So there's a, again, God establishes his system of government, system of justice uh, in the book of Exodus. That's why, you know, police officers carry guns that's the equivalent of Romans 13. They carry the sword. Um, so God has entrusted those men and women with the ability to take life. And obviously that's not something ever to be uh, flippant about. And I've never met a person who's a police officer that was flippant about that. Um, but they are, again, in law enforcement specifically, they bear the sword. And... Um, it's, it's a serious thing. It's for some reason in our culture today, especially, we are, we are bucking the fact that God appointed these men and women in that spot as law enforcement. And if you break the law or you do certain things, they are given the sword by God to take your life. Like, that's, that's, that is from God. That's, that's not a... It's not just a traditional thing. They're they are given the authority by God to hold life and death in their hand. And uh, so again, all my friends that are in government, I tell them that. 
You pull your gun, you kill somebody, God's given you that authority, but you better make certain that you're doing it right. So it's the same with justice, right? Our justice system, our judges and juries. And, uh, but again, God wasn't specific about what the judge and jury and all that stuff looked like. He just established the principle of justice. How we get to that may look different throughout centuries or may look different throughout cultures. But someone that murders somebody, their life is forfeit. And um, so we live in a society. And again, I don't know where people sit on this, and I'm not trying to be offensive or rude. This and this, gone. Gone. So, justice. Justice is someone gets murdered. So, I've met lots of murderers in my life. Lots and lots and lots. Hundreds at this point in my life. And um, share the gospel with them. Care for them. Love them. I don't wish hell on anybody. I really do not. Because hell is horrifying. But a person who, who murders, it is, it is an injustice for society, particularly people, culture, society, family, that was victimized to then pay for that person to eat and sleep for the rest of their life. That's, that's an injustice. That's not, God, God does not promote that. And so, you know, we have, we have obviously an incarceration issue in our country and a lot of it is because we don't give people real justice. We don't. And then we don't promote righteousness. And so that's why we're seeing, again, what we're seeing in society today is just an outgrowth of those two things, just being forfeited, gone. So, you know, the Constitution, which again, I don't preach the Constitution, um, speaks of capital punishment as to be forget the exact verbiage of it. it escapes my mind right now because I used, used to be sharp on some of that stuff and my brain has given up on remembering a lot of those things. But um, no, just a, a just society will have executions. I do, not, I do not think they need to be public. Right? I don't think we all need to go down to the city square to see someone hang. That seems dark and sadistic and a little weird but it is just and someone murders my wife god forbid justice is them for to, for them to die doesn't mean i can't forgive them it doesn't mean they have to go to hell but you're out you're dead and i i, I mean i again if i'm talking to dudes i don't really say this a lot with women around maybe it's just a sensitivity thing but like um you, you molest a kid and you're convicted, there's two or three witnesses, you got 30 minutes. You want a priest, you want a pastor, what do you want? But you got 30 minutes. At the end of it, you're out. You're gone. And that's not because you wish hell on people. That's not because you want to be cruel to people. That's because we're going we're gonna to give people justice. So a real pick-me-up, by the way. Uh, I just want to let you know about that one. No, no, it's okay. It's a good question. It really is. Part of what, part of what frustrates me, I don't think really any of us have a preference of, yes, the death penalty. If we do, that's really dark, right? But our preference is back to this. I don't know why I didn't draw this all year, apparently. Scripture has to rule that. And, and we have to say, this is what the Lord has established as justice. And, um, you know, there, there are folks that we have met with who terrible crimes, crimes have been done against them where the family or the church tried to handle it themselves. That's not our lane of authority. Crime is to be dealt with by government. There's things that government's not supposed to deal with. Like the church deals with things, or families deal with things, sure, or it's a workplace issue. But if there's a crime, that's what the, that's what the justice system is for. Um, and there are people who heinous things were done to them, and they were never given justice. And, and the truth is, one day, the men, women in positions of power 
will answer to God. They will answer to God for not giving people justice. I just think, again, in this, I know some of the circumstances and situations in this room and folks watching online, so it's a sensitive issue. It's a real issue that many people, that many people face. Um, and I, I, you know, justice is, uh, it's just gone. It's super sad. It's just terrible. You know, you think about some of the heinous things that have been done in the world you know, a doctor like Larry Nassar. Like, you got a lineup of these young girls. You got 30 minutes. You want a pastor, you want a priest, because it's lights out. Right? I don't wish hell on you. You can be, someone wants to forgive you, great. But guess what? It's, it's time to face justice. And, um, but we don't do that. So every one of those young girls that was victimized is going to pay their taxes and they're going to fund that guy to eat and they're going to fund that guy to house. They're going to fund that guy to have recreation. They're going to fund that guy to go to any school or any classes or anything, hobbies he wants to get into. That's not justice. That's, that's re-victimizing victims. And um, it's just it's sad. It's tragedy. But again, I want to go back to this I said at the very beginning. In America, I can't really speak to other countries, but historically, if you look at, at times we were really overzealous to execute. Like you look back through some things, it's like, that was probably not, <laughs> that, that did not warrant the punishment that was given. So I think sometimes the fear is returning back to a very, you know, rigid, rough system of justice. So the pendulum swings to injustice and, um, so it's it's really tragic. It's really tragic. So, does anybody have any follow ups? Obviously, that's a heavy question. I didn't know we were going to end the year with that one, but it was a good question. It really is. So, anybody? Else? And someone asked a question online that uh, I will I will answer, and uh, I will answer. I'll have my wife answer it. So it's a question about Satan, but um, it's a it's a real good question. Okay. Anybody else follow ups at all? I mean, obviously that's a a weighty subject. I'm trying to think if there's anything more that I should say about that. If you have any other questions, you have follow ups on that, I'd be happy to stay after and answer that. That's obviously a. Um, to be really frank with you, too, it's a, it has become, it's not really anymore, it's really fallen off the political spectrum. Um, it's not a political issue. It's a righteousness issue. It's a justice issue. But um, we're 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 so broken. <laughs> we're just we're just so we're just so broken as a society. It's it's really it's really tragic. When it says it in the word about uh, murder, Bonnie was kind of confused when you said it's like somebody a molester or something like that should get. Punishment. Sure. Just murderers. So again, murderers. But then, if you go to, you go to Exodus, you'll see there are certain things that it's it's game over. There there are certain things. Even Jesus said, "You offend one of these little ones, it's better for you to tie a millstone around your leg and plunge yourself into the sea." Like, sorry, man. And so what we're seeing is, again, I'll just rant here and then I'll try to shut this one down. We are seeing, and we've seen it for decades now, we're seeing the sexual sexualization of children. And then, then we're shocked at the amount of abuse. It's shocking. Where'd this all come from? Like, no, we've been doing it. When I was a teenager, like, oh, so I was 15, 16 years old, when you're 15 or 16 years old, you can, again, it's sin, but just follow my train of logic here if you can. We all have crushes on pop stars that are 15 or 16 years old. Why in the heck do grown men, is that permitted over a 15 or 16 year old girl? That's a child. That's a, that's a kid. 
And we wonder, I mean, we've just been planting those seeds and, and now the harvest is here and it's nasty. We're reaping a whirlwind. And, um, and then there's all this shock. Oh my goodness, where, where does this come from? It's not that people can't be forgiven. You know, again, I know lots of murderers and I know lots of molesters. So I was a men's pastor for years. It was ironic. I was the men's pastor and the kids pastor. So I taught kids in the morning and then I had multiple sex offenders in my men's class. Glad they were there. There was, there was restrictions, right? Not in my kids' class, in my men's class. Multiple restrictions. You're not going to cross a single line. You're not going to forget to dot an I or cross a T. And if you do, you're out the door. And I love you and I care for you. And again, I don't wish bad on you, but like, you're not doing that. And um, I'm thankful they were there, you know. Um, but there's, again, there's a, there's a cost to crime. There's a cost, and, and that's, that's what justice is supposed to do. And I know, I mean, we've got lots of law enforcement sitting in this room or watching online and spouses of law enforcement. It's frustrating to do your job, and then the justice system just really suck. It's like, what the heck, man? I just put my life on the line for that? Like, and that's, that's what we did? It's a wreck. And um, so part of it comes back to, we're calling things unrighteous. We're starting to say things that are unrighteous or righteous. So that's, that's the scriptural warning. Woe to you who says good is bad and bad is good. Woe to you. Like you are, you are a wreck. So there is sexual perversion that is paraded in the world as righteous and okay and approved. And then there's, the again, the over-sexualization of children. We wonder why so much perversion is happening. People wonder why things are happening when 25% of the internet is pornography. Like, <laughs> okay, here it is. We're, we sowed it, and now we're reaping a whirlwind. And meanwhile, the church is over here bickering about stupid crap, stupid stuff. And it's like, well, let's fight about this, and let's fight about that. And it's like, okay. It's that, and that's the part that, it, that just really enrages me. It's like, we, we want to have these dumb little, like, petty fights over here when the world is legitimately crumbling around us, needing the hope of the gospel. Okay, let's fight over dumb stuff. Let's waste our time, you know, church shopping and all this other nonsense and what in the world like let's let's waste our time if, if you guys knew the complaints that i field from time to time about dumb stuff in our church like i had a guy blow me up over my easter sermon because it didn't talk about the resurrection and it's like okay man you you preferred that that's okay there's nothing wrong with that but really how about we all take our time and focus on seeing people saved as opposed to advancing our preferences or impressing that on someone, someone else. I mean, it's just, because again, you talk about these issues and the, the terribleness of the world, and then it's like, okay, let's get busy proclaiming the gospel. Let's get busy working for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Now, let's, let's complain because... I, gosh, let's complain because we painted a wall. I'm serious. Let's we 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 painted we painted a room we shouldn't have. It's a bad color. It was a terrible color. We shouldn't have done that. Like I've fielded that complaint in the last year. Like um, <laughs> I sat with a pastor the other day. I'm gonna get myself in trouble. I should really shut up. Jen's at home going, "Shut up! You're gonna get us in. It's gonna be over." Uh, it, last year. Preferences. Some people preferred Donald Trump to be the president. Some people preferred Joe Biden to pre be the president. Great. Prefer who you want to prefer. Who cares? Who cares? But they started for us. They wanted the church. Me. If I told you the amount of times people, you, you should talk about that more. You, you should, like, what? And then COVID-19. You should tell people that masks are stupid. You should tell people they should wear masks. We've had people leave our church because I didn't mandate masks. Leave the church. Mad at me because I didn't care about people. We had a guy yell at one of our pastors a couple weeks ago telling him he was killing people. No joke. All because of this.
And you know this about me. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. That's okay. Like this is, this is a preference of a person. You want to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. You don't want to get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. I'm a preacher of the word of God, not a medical professional, right? If you want medical advice, you go to a doctor, right? You go to a medical professional. And so we have let all that stuff, and then you've watched people twist scripture to promote their preferences. And it is just nuts. So we're going to try not to do that. And sometimes it'll offend you. And I hope that you are mature enough to go, ah, I got offended because that was my preference and I didn't get what I wanted there. Okay. Okay. The older I get, the more weirded out I am by stage design stuff. We have plants on the stage with bricks. Okay. Okay, who cares? Right? Who, who cares? Someone put time and effort into that to the glory of God. Have a great time. Have a great time. What's that? <laughs> What's that? They're blaming No, John didn't do that. He's not, he, he's not that artistic. So John's the HVAC guy, and he can do a whole bunch of other stuff. Artistic is not his thing. Gifted interpretive dancer, though. So I hope you guys get to see that someday. All right. Uh, let's end there. And... Uh, Again, thanks for, thanks for hanging out. Um, I, I will ask for your feedback. If you really liked Q&A and you want to continue it again in the fall, shoot me an email and say, hey, I liked Q&A. If you hated Q&A and you think it's dumb, send me an email. I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm asking for that feedback because I don't know. That's that. Hey, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, I want to know what that. I do want to know that. I do. But it also might be, we might not do what you want to do. But I, I really would like to know because... I, told you, I tell you this every semester at the beginning of every growth meeting. I'm the worst growth community leader in our church. Uh, Jason Combs and I have now talked. He thinks he's the worst. And uh, we both are terrible, terrible growth community leaders. And so trying something different this year and, and I don't know. Not our preference, huh? All right, this one time. <laughs> I totally contradicted everything. You're all like, I don't know what to do now. But yeah, just let me know what you think. Let me know what you think for the fall. And um, um, we'll do that, okay? Let's pray. We'll get out of here. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of the scripture. Oh, God, that we can come back to it. It's an anchor. And I do pray um, I do pray that we will not fall into the trap of our preferences over scripture that the scripture will be the final authority, Lord, in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before you go, one thing. I'm going to give you one word, okay? When these dictate these, that's called legalism. Good night, everybody. (laughs) 